And tonight we are taking a close look here at a couple cases that got a lot of attention. Northwestern, um, where there was a move here to give scholarship football players the right to form a union and, rec and be recognized as school employees. Um, it's a decision uh, as it works its way through the legal process that could change conceivably the face of college athletics. Um, I'll give you an idea of uh, nationally, at least, where the public stands on this. So there's a Washington Post ABC News poll, and it was taken back in March when this story um, was hottest. And it shows that most people in the general public are against paying athletes, which surprised me at least. 47% uh, against the move, while a third supported here. And we have this idea, this concept um, of, uh, we used to, broadcast Army football games. And when you go through that facility, when you go through Mikey Stadium, you look at back in the day what it was like, there are places and there are sports where the true concept of amateur athletics, you certainly find it at the Division Three level. I know that from yes. personal experience. It's real. But Ivy League. without putting um, schools' names to it, you guys have been around the block and seen all different programs here. Is that still really there when you're talking the biggest sports of football and basketball. I'm sure you can find it with, you know, the crew or the gymnastic teams or the rest. But when you're talking football and basketball division one, is it Pollyannish to think that there's really such a thing as student, the student athlete is what we imagine it? It's virtually impossible. Uh, Forty years ago when we played sports, I don't think that we were taken up with 60 hours a week involved uh, in, our, in our sport. Uh, today in football, it's not unusual, and they, they went through the whole thing at Northwestern, they actually laid it out there very clearly how much time was being spent. 5.30 in the morning for mandatory weightlifting, and then meeting uh, several times during the day to do, uh, uh, watching the films and going over and over and over again, coming back again at night, practicing I don't know how many hours, and then coming back, doing some more film after that, and then maybe some study hall. That's so alien to me. I, I played football. We played a national championship football team. Nothing like that was, was the case. They, they, they <laughs> treated us like we were in boot camp. It was tough and it was difficult, but we had time to be students. We truly and did. And I know you've got some kids that are amazing, double majors. They're doing everything. They're still performing on the field. Mm -hmm. But are those guys nowadays the exception, not the norm? Well, I, th I think you're, you're right. They are an, an unusual group of uh, uh, scholar athletes when you talk about it. One year, I had six student athletes on my baseball team in the late 70s that were pre-med, all of whom are doctors today. They couldn't get a sign straight from third base, but they knew how to do the, <laughs> <laughs> they knew how to do the chemistry and the biology. Um, but my point that, that uh, Alan was just talking about, there was a rule, and I say was, that's the operative term where you were limited to 20 hours a week yeah. to practice and compete. And if you were going on a road to compete, you'd only be charged three hours. Well, that's bogus. That's not what exists. Because the reality is, and this is part of the point that is being made by Northwestern student athletes, uh, is that uh, it's, the, it's, the truth of the matter is they might be putting 50 hours a week in. And, and it almost forced them to do the basket weaving courses and the rest yes, here yes. and be so distanced from the rest of the yeah. student body, you don't have that yeah. experience that maybe you guys yeah, have. Well, you know, yeah, the, the University of North Carolina's Chapel Hill has had, had issues yeah. around that very point. Yeah, you're Tutoring talking, you're and all the rest. about the NCAA's purpose is to uh, maintain a clear, uh, to maintain athletes as an integral part of the student body and maintain a clear line of demarcation between professional and college sports. How can you become an integral part of the mm. student body when you, you're isolated on the on the edge of campus all day long and you're not having a chance to go to the same courses that everyone else is. It's a you total mentioned the NCAA. Are they part of the problem or the solution <laughs> here? <laughs> that's, that's he almost went blue they, on me. They, yeah. they, they should no. be part of the solution, but they are a significant part of the problem as well. I said earlier that I, I supported unionization. And I support unionization because of what the NCAA has done. It has transformed athletes into employees. They did that. They transform them into employees with that one-year renewable scholarship and with the incredible demands that they make on these athletes as a condition for continuing on on, on scholarship. But in my all honesty, I don't support the unionization effort as a solution. I support that we should, uh, I, I think they're doing the right, right thing, but I would prefer that we pay the athletes back, not in terms of money, not in terms of, uh, of collective bargaining, et cetera, but that we write some federal legislation that really insists that 
educational and medical kinds of, of uh, compensation come back to the athletes as their compensation for what they're doing on the athletic field. And here field. comes the rub, okay. Um, can you take the genie out of the bottle a little, Don? C can you do what the doctor's proposing, because it makes sense to me, but can you do that without inadvertently bankrupting some, if not the majority, of even Division I programs, where now they say, wait a second, you're asking me to have, Title IX said I gotta have a certain amount of programs. I gotta give equal, basically, uh, playing fields for women and men. That means those sports that make no money, we gotta still subsidize them all, and we gotta carry as many female teams as we do men teams. And we've seen a lot of iconic sports teams that have gone the way. I remember one year, Providence, their baseball team went to the Final Four. Um, you know, and then the next year the program was defunct. You've done the math of this. You've been an AD, okay? Yeah, yeah. Can we do what he's saying and still have the sports landscape the way that we recognize it now? Can I sir, first clarify what I was yeah, saying? I knew you were going to do it. You're going to put a condition on it. No, I, no, a little, I don't right. want a condition. I just want to clarify so he answers the question that <laughs> threw out there. The way he wants me to. Yeah. What, no. <laughs> what we're suggesting in, in my, my group that's writing the legislation right now called the CAP Act is that we would like the NC this newly structured, a newly structured NCAA to actually own its football championship it would own his football championship just like it now owns the basketball championship. With the money and revenue that would come in from that new football championship, we would use that money to spread about and to pay for some of the things we're talking about. Spread it into Division I uh, and two and three. Have athletes uh, with uh, medical rights and insurance plans and catastrophic injury insurance and so forth okay, that would I go across the board. I haven't and done I the math and I we could pay you, for it. But can we we were talking before, <laughs> how many programs actually make money now? Well, that was part of what we were talking about earlier. If there are 15, that's probably an exaggeration. And, and he's it, talking it, about the whole landscape of college yeah, athletics yeah, here. We're yeah. talking the big boy sports here, football. Uh, right. That's what's making the money. Right, exactly. Uh, but I, I uh, in principle, I, I always in principle agree with the things that Alan says. <laughs> well, uh, but when they get to there the, comes the, smack, yeah. get to the <laughs> but, practical <laughs> side of some of these issues, uh, and, and you brought it up about if the money is there, the revenue is, cr is generated through bowl games and whatever to filter it down to you know, give it to the teams and the programs that, that do not make any money. But in reality, when you get right back and go full circle, well, how much revenue is really there to distribute in the first place? And the thing that we need to be very careful about, it's not that we have to provide equal number of sports, men and women, but the commitment on the financial side of the ledger has to be very close to being equal. Um, and I don't want to get into the technicalities of Title IX. Not, frankly, I'm not even qualified to speak to it. But the point being is that, for example, in financial aid, you, the financial aid that is offered an athlete versus what might be on the horizon for football and basketball and others that make money is that this that disproportion is going to create an, uh, a Title IX violation. So we, we, we need to tiptoe through this before we get too giddy about what mm. we're going to do with the money. And we're right up against it on time. We could do this for an hour. I could talk about quarter scholarships, third scholarships. People don't realize this in some sports. Yeah. Not all athletes get free rides at college. In fact, the majority don't, mm -hmm. even at the huge universities. But do you both believe if we sit down at this same table two years, five years from now, whether at a necessity or through the courts, something seismic will have changed? I think so. And I think what I'm talking about, the kinds of uh, benefits I'm looking for for this legislation that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm discussing, I think that can be done. I think we can take 5% of, of Alabama's uh, revenue from football and basketball and so forth and put that aside for an academic trust fund that would allow athletes to come back to school or to go on for a graduate degree. I think there are places, I think, I don't think that, uh, but how does New Mexico I don't think, State do I don't this? Think my, my point is, they're not getting a big piece of one of the big five conference television pies. They're not filling up the stands or selling merchandise through the roof. What happens there? Well, we think there's enough money that uh, we're talking about coming out of this national championship football game. That's going to go back. And we both and know how this is going to go. And All of a sudden, Big Five <laughs> conferences are going to say, why do we need to be in the NCAA, NCAA well, anymore? Why don't we set up our own group and, and then, then goodbye? Uh, well, that's then, a conversation then, that's then they're going yeah. to be, then they're exposing themselves to being no longer not-for-profit organizations. They're going to have to start paying taxes. They're going to be uh, professional sports, and, and the costs are greater professional mm. sports. They, very, they really are. Yes, they are. I think, Rich, some of this has quieted down to a degree. The NSA Board of Directors and the 
uh, NCAA uh, Steering Committee on Governance is taking a close look about what it is that makes good sense for the Big Five to be able to move off somewhat on their own, but yet still be integrated with the, uh, the whole notion of D Division One. They don't want to give up the no. basketball tournament. No. You know, so if they did what you, might, you alluded to it earlier, by what, what create a whole different enterprise, $11 billion in 10 years with all that TV money, they want a piece of that as well as all the ball money. Paul. You know, we're up against, there's so much, for example, you go into a, a store and I buy a kid's uh, jersey here and the kid doesn't see a yeah. penny of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we could get into this. I, I do think people understand the status quo can't prevail. Um, whether it's had the video game loss or the aban abandoned case or what we're talking about at Northwestern, things are going to change. Uh, and I'm just going to be fascinated how this all stakes out here because I, I don't think the general public realizes just how tenuous the status quo is Let right me now. make one, one more point. The NCAA understands how tenuous yep. it is. Things are, are, are happening right now, which we used to argue about three years ago, which you don't have to argue about anymore. We used, well, to, argue, argue, we used yeah. to argue about multi-year scholarships. Now they're being accepted, these multi-year yeah. scholarships that extend to. I just saw the Atlantic Coast Clock Conference has a whole set of 10 proposals. Those proposals could have come right out of uh, some of the proposals that we were making over, over the years and arguing about. Now they're not even arguable. The NCA realizes it has to change, and it's going to be changing quite a bit, uh, or it's going to disintegrate. Yeah. Well, I know this much. <laughs> um, you both played, and you coached, and you also were AD on this, and you both love, and I think we believe there's a place for college athletics, um, that it's not, yeah, but there's a place for it. I think it's great for the kids, it's great for the school. Hopefully they find a way around it and I know uh, we're gonna be talking again. Alan, Don, thank you guys very much. You're I welcome. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed it. <laughs> okay, everybody, um, they'll continue fighting in the green room. When we come back here, we will switch gears to a story that we've been talking about for quite a while in this program, uh, the VA and its chief, Eric Shinseki, he's facing the music and Facing mounting pressure here to resign following new VA hospital mismanagement allegations. We'll bring a panel in on that for weigh-in after this.